the moment he said R Ruben Oslund is directing a film after his Palm d'Or of the Square, and I said, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go. I don't think I'm going to make that. But no. And he said, no, just go and try. See what happens. You know, just have fun with it. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce the superstar heroine of the movie, Dolly De Leon. <laughs> High praise, Dolly. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This is a really nice goodbye gift because I'm going home tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Dolly, I want to start because this is an audience of actors, and I suspect that some people might be seeing you on film here for the first time. But you are a very accomplished actress in the Philippines. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to just rewind a little bit before we get to this incredible movie and talk about what was that initial spark for you? How did you know you wanted to be an actress. What did the beginning of your career look like? Uh, the beginning of my career really started when I was in university. My course was theater arts, so I was a Bachelor of Arts Theater Arts graduate. So when I was a freshman, I was already very active with our place, our university place. And our university place were the kinds of place that people would you know, travel a long way just to watch because we were directed by very good professors and very good directors in our university. So I, I think that um, most of my training is really from doing Pinter and Shakespeare and Beckett and Chekhov, you know, um, uh, playwrights like that. And eventually I you know, a transition to film and television because theater in the Philippines is not really a kind of profession you can make a decent living out of. I mean, it's hard everywhere, but so you had some, <laughs> as we all know, but you had some experience with absurdists already, so that's interesting. And then, of course, I, I just want everyone to know that you have won the Philippine equivalent of an Academy and Award for a Best Supporting Actress. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. Um, it actually happened um, a few years back. It, it's called the FAMAS, the, the Philippine Awarding. Sorry, I don't even know the acronym, acronym was wrong with me. But anyway, we, we call it FAMAS, the FAMAS. Um, it's, yeah, it's the oldest award-giving body in the Philippines. And I got it during the pandemic, actually, in 2020. So I've never really even experienced going up on stage and receiving an award because it, you know, it happened virtually. The award was delivered to my house and they were taking a video of me accepting it in my, you know, shorts and my t-shirt. So, yeah, it was that kind of anticlimactic award, award, award receiving ceremony. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit from the pandemic to um, Ruben Ostland. And uh, had you seen his movies before? Had you seen The Square or Force Majeure? I had seen The Square. Um, I had not seen Force Majeure yet. But when I knew that I was going to audition for the part of Abigail, I made a point to see Force Majeure just so I could familiarize myself with his work. And so what did you think? How, how did the project come to you? How did the audition come to you? Um, it they got in touch with um, two people in the Philippines. One is an actor who works also internationally, and another is a producer. So they got in the actor Jake Makapagal. He was the one who got in touch with me and sent me an email and told me to audition. And the moment he said R Ruben Oslund is directing a film after his Palm d'Or of the Square, and I said. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go. I don't think I'm going to make that. But no. And he said, no, just go and try. See what happens. You know, just have fun with it. And that's what I did. I just went there and I had fun with it. I dressed the part. You know, I didn't put on any makeup. I wore jeans and a, 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 a peach shirt. And I just went in there and I memorized the lines just so they would be impressed by me because I memorized the lines. So I wasn't holding a script. So yeah, and, and we did the three scenes, the, the giving of the octopus, the, the when they, f 
when they didn't watch the fire and they stole some food. And the third was in the lifeboat with Carl. <laughs> the fun one. We'll get to that. <laughs> so were you in a room with Ruben or was it a Zoom audition or were you with a casting director? He sent the casting director to the Philippines and what she would do is she would um, choose from the auditionees of that day and she would take out uh, those she didn't feel were qualified, and then she would send the footage to Ruben. And then that went on for, I believe, four or five days. And then after that, uh, Ruben came up with a short list and then set up a Skype meeting with all of us individually with, just to see if... Um, well, I found out recently that the reason why he did that was because he wanted to know if we were fun to work with because he likes to have fun on set. So, <laughs> But I really thought it was another audition or a job interview. I mean, fun, I'm sure, it it's just feels like the through line. I imagine you must have had so much fun making this movie. Um, and so I, when you first read the script, when you first got the whole script and were able to read the whole thing and your piece in it, what were your initial thoughts? You know, it's funny. I read the script after I got the part. So... Um but by that time, I already had an idea about who Abigail was and how the story was going to go. Because just by the three scenes, you have more or less an idea of what's going to happen. And there was also a, a short paragraph, like a synopsis of the film. So by the time I had read the script, I already had an idea about Abigail's journey as a character. But then reading every all the other characters and how everything was falling into place into a three-part movie made it even more beautiful to me. And I knew it was something important and I knew it was something that, that you know, that would be recognized or that would be appreciated because of the so many twists and turns that happen in the film. And, and the beauty of working with Ruben is he doesn't really care too much about twists. It just so happens that he, the twists happen because of a situation that they're in and they cause certain incidents that happen and and yeah it it was just exciting to finally start filming because i auditioned in 2018 and and we started filming in 2020 so it was a really long um uh, it was long labor pains four years of being pregnant with this baby he, I mean, he's playing with so many stereotypes and so many, you know, gender balance and race and so many different power inequalities. And you are such the hero in that first scene where we realize the way you're dividing the octopus. I mean, audiences are cheering and hollering and empathizing with you. How did you... How did you break down that scene and those beats? I mean, you're, you assert dominance immediately in this new world order. How did you as an actress find the right tone to achieve that dominance? The tone of that scene really came from the scene that happened prior to that, which is um, when they knock on the lifeboat and take away all her supplies. That's where it really starts because... You know, when she sees them, she's she's happy to see them because, you know, they're people and she needs company, of course. But then when they start taking away her food and her water, that's when she realizes, oh, these people are not going to ration the supplies. They're going to finish it up. I mean, you saw how they drank the water. It's like there's no they were drinking water like there's no tomorrow. So she saw that immediately. And that's when she made that decision that she had to take control. So that's just where I took it from, from that decision of seeing how irresponsible they are and also where the line um then don't maybe you shouldn't be so lazy and dependent on me also came from because of because of the way they were just taking away everything and eating chips like they were watching a movie right they were just sitting there and eating chips like it was nothing and she saw that and she saw that they wouldn't survive with that kind of behavior so you're shooting outside i'm assuming i'm assuming that i don't i've got no idea how they manage the sound of what you're doing on the beach um, there's very little light at night. Can you just describe for us, you know, were there rehearsals? What, you know, how, how was the coverage covered? We would rehearse every day before or every night before every scene. So we would just sit without any blocking, just sitting and throwing lines. 
And, and talking about the scene and what we, th he would always ask us, do you think Abigail would say this? Do you think Yaya would say this? And we would answer and say, no, we don't think they would, but maybe this. So he would adjust the script based on that and we would run the lines and he'd have them printed and then we'd memorize the lines for the next day. So it was that kind of thing. And I think the, 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 you know, the repetition, the so many takes that we did in the actual um, filming day helped a lot because it, it kind of also served as a, <laughs> I sound so unprofessional, but it's, it served as a time for us to memorize our lines <laughs> because we kept just doing it over and over and again because, you know, we'd film today, rehearse a scene tonight, and then film that scene that we rehearsed the next day. So that laid out m the groundwork for the whole day when we would start with the first 10 takes until it would get to 20 or 30 or 40. <laughs> Amazing. So you were giving them lots of options. Uh, it really, it gets interesting on the first night when you divide the men from the women. It's like, oh, Abigail has a plan. You know, we're interested what happens here. And then the scene the next day is so brilliant when you infantilize the boys. First, that they couldn't keep the fire. They had one job to do. They are so useless, right? <laughs> Those two boys, I'm not talking about men in general, just the, those two men, yeah. They're, they just totally let go of their responsibilities. And actually, Abigail's choice of inviting um, Paula and Yaya to the boat was actually, I don't know if you saw it, but it was her way of uh, damage control, of controlling the damage that she caused because she caused quite a rift with Paula by you know questioning her authority. So that was just her way of you know, keeping all the girls on the same side on her side because she knew that the power of women is, you know, um, more um, intimidating, I suppose, than the power of men in that situation. And yeah, and yeah, that's what happened. It is very admirable. Then, of course, there's the issue with the pretzel sticks and here the boys are lying. Yes, uh, and that was, that's what I auditioned. So, um, yeah, it was... Uh, it, it's really funny because when we were filming that, it was it, that scene is actually a little bit longer, but they had to cut it because you know it, the film actually I think the first edit was four and a half hours, yeah. So yeah, they had to cut that, but it was so much fun playing it because I think that was the one scene that we were just laughing between takes because you know Harris the actor who plays Carl just kept doing this with his hands and it was like such a big deal. Don't wave your hands, you know. Yeah, I would do that. It's like. I was just laughing so hard because I, I don't even know what the problem is with waving your hands that way. So yeah, it was really, um, and it, it, also, it, it also kind of served as um, a preparation for Abigail's you know, invitation to Carl to join him in the boat. So it's, it's also like an excuse that she was given to be able to invite him to the boat. So let's get to cutie pie. How much fun were your scenes with Carl? You know what? They were not fun. Why do you guys think it was fun? It was not fun. I mean, filming an intimate scene is never fun. It's very technical. You have to think of so many things. And I was just so nervous that day. I mean, I was so nervous that my mouth was dry. And that's what you see when I spray the Evian bottle in my mouth. That is real thirst because... I was so nervous. My throat was dry. I couldn't say cut. You don't do that. I mean, that's a no-no. You can't say cut. Only the director can say cut. And the Evian bottle was there, so I took it and I sprayed my mouth. And then I figured, okay, I'll share it. So I sprayed his mouth too. And then I sprayed his whole body and just played with a can. So, it, yeah, it was very nerve-wracking. And we did that so many times. I don't even, I, I've lost count of how many times we've done it. But well, the thing with Harris is he's really a great actor to work with. He's, you know, he's, he's in the moment. He doesn't plan ahead. He doesn't anticipate what you're going to do. So it's very exciting to work with him. In fact, because he never anticipates, when I sprayed him his mouth, he choked. He literally choked. But nothing bad happened to him. We didn't have to take him to the hospital or anything. It's just water. So after that, I just said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I won't do it again. And Ruben says, no, do it again. <laughs> so he made me do it in all the takes after that. And then Harris didn't choke anymore. 
I think it's an interesting sort of dramatic function of the, of the film that we are still, even though we know what's about to happen when she's calling the whistle, um, that we are still somehow shocked to, to actually see that scene, to be to see that intimacy between you and to see and try and understand the power dynamic and, and what is really happening in that scene during that conversation. I, I think that the reason why it's it's a little jarring to, or it's a surprise when you see that scene is because you don't expect to see something like that. Um, it's well for some people it may be quite unsavory to see you know an, an older woman being with a young man, and I I think that's you know that surprise that people usually encounter. But the great thing about this is Abigail is now exploiting her power. She's also using her um, ability to fish. And her and she, and she's you know um, she has needs you know she's a woman so her needs need to be met so she uses Carl and uses the power that she has on the island to to make herself happy. <laughs> and Carl seems pretty simple. I love you. You give me fish. I mean, arguably a fair trade. Right. Um, and. And the the funny thing is about that is Abigail doesn't even take offense because she really knows how spineless Carl is and how, you know, he's not really <laughs> very, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, if you know what I mean. So she doesn't even take offense in that because it's true. It is a transaction. But, you know, I, I, I do have... Um, I do believe that when we were filming it, Abigail um, and I, I, I... It was intentional on my part as an actor. I wanted to make sure that it would be seen that Abigail has some affection for Carl. And it's not just a transaction to her. Um, she did put some stock into that uh, relationship. And it wasn't just, you know, um, a marketplace to her. It was, you know, a, to her it was a relationship. That's why she kissed him when Yaya knocked on the boat. It's like, oh, he's mine. Look, we're together. And it, it's sort of interesting that the, the follow-up conversation, which is sort of like the stereotypical other woman conversation, but you're having to have it with Carl about how he's going to talk to Yaya about what is really happening between the two of you. Yes, that scene in the lifeboat is actually also a role reversal. Usually the story is uh, a married man has a mistress and there's a kept woman who's the mistress. In this case, Carl is the kept man. So it's the roles are reversed and Abigail is the, supposedly the man in power or the man with wealth who... Um, uh, you know, uh, provides um, nourishment for, for the partner. So yeah, the roles are really reversed there. And usually it's, uh, uh, well, the perception is usually the women are more needy, but in this case, Carl's the one who's more needy and who, who needs affirmation from Abigail and even asking permission if he should break up from Yaya. I think uh, another thing that's fascinating about this movie is that we can all believe that different things are true and they are and I love the sister the sisterhood and Yaya talks to her about you know how she admires the matriarchy and you domesticated the older males you know we saw that happen and it's interesting that that's the conversation in the lead up <laughs> yes it yeah it's it and it makes it actually even more painful into that you know the final scene but I think that Ab Yaya was saying that um, actually to suck up to Abigail to, you know, I'm kind of flatter, her, flatter her, put her on her good side because after all she did get in between her and Carl and she really does love Carl a lot. So that was her way of being, you know, friends with the enemy, you know, in like in the art of war in the book, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. So that's what I think A Yaya was doing at that point. And of course, the final scene, open to interpretation. I don't know if I think it's probably rude to ask you for your interpretation, but I would like to ask you about how you approached it. And as as you were filming, you know, how you prepared psychologically for the scene on the beach. That scene was the hardest for me to do because um, I was so nervous about it. I knew it was a very important scene and I knew it was a very pivotal scene. So um, I even requested for some time with Ruben to talk to him about it and ask him if, you know, we can add some elements to it. So 
um, yeah, that scene was really, really difficult for me to do. And no, I take no offense in you asking me what the ending is. But I would like to know, what do you think the ending is? Do you think she does it? Who, who thinks she does it? Raise your hand. Oh, guys. A lot of people. Wow. And who thinks she didn't do it? Oh, yes. Faith in Humanity Restored. All right. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of this film is that, you know, the conversation doesn't end in, in this room. It goes on when we leave the theater and we talk about it with, you know, our, the people we're with and we ask ourselves questions. Why would we think that she would do it? Um, maybe that's very reflective on, on the state of the state we're in right now, our headspace. If she doesn't do it, why do we think that way? So I think it's really very reflective of the viewer of where we are at this point in our lives. Uh, what is our state of mind? What are you know? Wh what are we going through? And I think that that's the beauty of the film. It's really up to you what you want to think. But since you watched it, I can share that. Of course, when we were filming it, of course, in in my head as an actor, of course, Abigail ends Yaya's life. That was in my head when we were filming it. But what's more important is the dilemma that Abigail goes through. It's not an easy decision for her to make. She doesn't want to, you know, hurt Yaya, but she doesn't want to. She do, she also doesn't want to go back to her old life. It's such a clever, clever, clever ending. It's such a clever film. Laugh out loud, funny, and and so thought provoking. I know we're all going to be thinking about it for a while. Such a brilliant performance. What a treat for us all to meet you in this role. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.